So the Adventist Health Study too brought in not quite 61,000 people and they were all over 30 and they split them into five groups based on the diets that they normally followed. And they looked at everyone's body mass index. Are you, are, body mass index. Are you familiar with that, BMI? It, it's just your weight, based on, but adjusted for how tall you are. And so a healthy BMI is below 25. So the band on the left, the red band there, those are non-vegetarians, or, or basically meat eaters. And their BMI was not below 25, it was 28.8. And the next group were people called semi-vegetarians, meaning they ate meat but only once a week or less. A little bit slimmer. The third group, the pesco-vegetarians, pesco meaning... Okay, all right, fish. They're not eating any meat except for fish. They're a little bit slimmer. And then the lacto-ovo-vegetarians, a little bit slimmer too. And then that fifth group, I always have to tell my patients that a vegan is not a person from the planet Vegas. Um, but they are not only a lot slimmer, but they're actually the only group smack in the middle of the healthy weight range. And so now, let's compare the lacto-ovo vegetarians and the vegans. Um, I am going to argue that cheese is one of the biggest contributors to the extra weight that we see with the lacto-ovos. And that difference is roughly 15 pounds. A cow does not give milk unless the cow has been pregnant. And like all mammals, they, they're, they're pregnant, they give birth, and, they, and the milk comes out. Okay, so as the pregnancy proceeds, hormones are produced in the, the body of, of the cow. And you can measure them in the blood plasma. And they, it goes up, and these hormones end up in the milk. There they go. And most of the milk that anybody ever drinks or that is on the shelves of any grocery store in America, most of it comes from pregnant cows because they're pregnant, impregnated annually. They're kept pregnant. And they have a lot of estrogen in them um, that's a match for your estrogen. And it, does this affect you? Would, would this affect a woman? Well, I don't know. But researchers have looked into this, and what they found is interesting. Uh, some Australian researchers in 2010 brought in a group of women who were postmenopausal, meaning shouldn't be having a lot of estrogen in your blood no matter what. And they put them into four groups depending on how much dairy they ate. And the group on the left was the people who were the dairy avoiders. And the other three bars are the people who have had, had dairy as a regular part of their life. And what seems to really make the difference is, do you have it or do you not have it? Once people are having a substantial amount, they tend to have a lot of estradiol in their blood. Men, don't go to sleep. Researchers at Rochester, New York, went into a fertility clinic and they interviewed men and said, are you a low cheese eater, half a serving a day, no more than that? Or are you a big cheese eater, like a serving, two and a half servings a day? And they looked at their sperm counts and the people who tended to avoid cheese had better sperm counts. The people who were big cheese folks had pretty low sperm counts. Now, is that because there are female hormones from the milk because the cows are pregnant and so you're getting estradiol with every glass of milk? I don't know. But Catherine said, let me give this a try. She went totally vegan and she went back to the doctor. The doctor did another laparoscopy and he looked around in her abdomen and he looked and he looked and he looked and he stopped and the, uh, she, she, the procedure was over. The doctor walked out to the waiting room and said to her husband, this is a miracle. Her endometriosis is for all intents and purposes gone. And the, her husband said, well, you know, it's amazing. I didn't really think the diet would work, but she's felt better and better and better. And, and it's, it's amazing. And the doctor said, no, there is no way that diet could do that. This is a miracle. <laughs> Medical science works in wonderful ways. She lost weight. Her endometriosis disappeared. She's got two kids. Um, and she's uh, now one of our Food for Life instructors. She goes around sharing her story and letting other people know that it's worth seeing if asparagus can help. Okay, so there's Catherine today. Uh, this is Mark Ramirez uh, from Detroit. Mark grew up in Texas, and he was recruited to the University of Michigan to play football. And if you weigh 300 pounds, that's a pretty good thing. 
if your job is to tear a hole in the defensive line. However, um, after his athletic career ended, he was unable to shake the weight. And he laid into cheese and meat in a pretty big way. He gained a lot of weight, he developed diabetes, his blood pressure went up, and he had erectile dysfunction, which a lot of guys have. And as, as you know, uh, or maybe don't know, erectile dysfunction is not caused by performance anxiety. Erectile dysfunction is a sign of narrowing arteries. In the same way as narrowed arteries can affect the heart or the brain, they affect any part of a man's body. And all that Viagra does is take those arteries that have been narrowed by years of a bad diet and try to open them up a little bit more. That's all it does. And so anyway, these are the problems that Mark had. And he was on a lot of medications. And I want to walk you through where the diabetes comes from. Because th this is the same cell I showed you earlier. But you have, if you have diabetes, you have glucose, sugar, in your blood, which is trying to get into the cell to give energy to the cell. That's what glucose is for. And the problem in diabetes is instead of getting into the cell, the glucose is building up in the bloodstream and you, you measure it. If it would get into the cell, everything would be fine. To get the glucose into the cell, you need insulin. Insulin is like a key. It's a hormone made in the pancreas and goes into the blood and, and it arrives like these little keys to the surface of the cell and attaches to that red receptor. And once it does, just like, just like a, a key in a lock, it causes these channels to open up. And there they go. There's the glucose coming into the cell. That's what's supposed to happen. And if you, di if you have diabetes, if you have type two, you've got glucose, you've got insulin, you've got receptors, you've got everything but you've also got intramyocellular lipid, fat building up inside the cell, and that causes the signaling not to work. It's like when I was a kid growing up in North Dakota, we had some of the neighbor kids would play a trick. You're not home, and they sneak up to your front door, and they put a tiny bit of chewing gum in your front door lock, and then they run and hide behind a bush. And you get home, and you take your key, and you put it in the... You put your key in put your key in the lock and it doesn't work. And you look at the key and it's fine, but you're either condemned to walking in and out your window for the rest of your life or calling somebody to clean the key out. It's a practical joke. Anyway, you don't have gum inside your cells. What you have is fat. And typical diabetes treatments ignore that. They don't deal with that fact. But on a plant-based diet, when you get the fat out of your diet, the fat starts to diminish inside the cells. That causes the signaling to be able to work again. And if you can get that signaling working, the diabetes can improve and in some cases go away. And that's what happened to Mark. Mark got better and better and better and better. And finally his doctor said, Mark, I don't know what you're doing. Your blood sugar is too low to need any medication. And at some point they erased the diabetes uh, diagnosis. It's all gone. And as he's, he's stuck with it and years have gone by and he's slim and he doesn't have diabetes or any of these health problems anymore. Okay, let's talk about asthma. Um, this is Chad from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. He lived right on the water with his brother and his family. And Chad was a very active kid. He loved sports, but he could not get through a baseball game because asthma would kick in after the exercise or all the pollen that he was uh, breathing in. And he had every kind of allergy. He was allergic to dust and all kinds of envir environmental things and animals. If he would go to a friend's house, he couldn't handle the dogs and the cats. And somebody, when he was about 18, said, hey, could it be dairy products? Why, why, don't, you, why don't you get away from dairy and just see? And he did. He tried it. And within about three months, not only was his asthma completely gone, but so were his allergies. And what's this about? Somehow, get, avoiding these antigens from dairy made his body react in a different way. So scientists have, have looked into this question. Could dairy products actually contribute to asthma? And if you go on Google and you type in asthma dairy, and the very first thing that comes up in your search is from the National Asthma Council of Australia, which has very helpfully gone straight in and answered this question for us. Dairy foods have often been suggested as a common trigger for asthma. 
but there's little scientific evidence to support this myth. And unfortunately, most Australians are missing out on the health benefits that come from consuming milk, cheese, and yogurt as they don't include enough dairy foods in their diet. Wait a minute. It's just starting to smell a little bit funny, isn't it? So I'm going to click on this website and see who sponsors them. And Dairy Australia is one of six sponsors, and the other five are drug companies. One makes money if you buy the cheese, and the others make money if you stay sick. So I looked at the report that they had quoted. They, they gave references to the studies that supposedly show that it doesn't work. And they weren't very big studies, but I looked at one. One was from New York University in 1991. Had 11 adults, they all had asthma, and they drank either whole milk, skim milk, or water. And what they showed is if they drank whole milk, their ability to have uh, gases pass through their lungs got progressively worse from the milk. And they thought it had to do perhaps with the fatty milk. So cheese would even be worse. Then there was a UK study from the United Kingdom. It was kids. They were between three and 14 years of age, and they gave them a milk and egg-free diet for eight weeks. And, and the way you test this, if, if, if you know anybody who has asthma, if you have it yourself, you try to see if the kid can breathe out, if they can have good expiratory flow, because that's what tends to go bad. And what they showed is that if they went egg and dairy-free, their ability to breathe out was much, much, much better. It really helped them clear up. Now, this was a study that went over eight weeks, and it just so happened that Easter was in the middle of that period. So they went to the chocolate factory and said, okay, do you have non-dairy bunnies for us? Which they did. And these kids got a lot better. Bottom line is I couldn't find evidence that set this aside. People haven't really looked at it very much at all because no one's making money if you stop consuming milk. But all the evidence I have seen and lots and lots of individual cases have suggested probably worth trying. Uh, migraine headaches. Uh, a lot of people have migraine headaches, unfortunately. This is Lauren. Lauren was an attorney. She was uh, 23 years old. And in law school, one day, her vision started to narrow. And she got this intense sledgehammer on half of her head. And she was sick, nauseated and vomiting. And she was not surprised. Because she had a family member who had exactly the same symptoms, and this is a migraine. The word comes from hemicrania, a Greek word that means half your brain, half your head, uh, because it's often a one-sided headache. Uh, very severe, long-lasting. If you uh, move or if you're um, in a, uh, too much light or too much sound, it, it just drives you crazy. And this can last overnight, it can last for a couple of days, and it interferes with everything you're trying to do. And everybody who has uh, migraines has heard about these trigger foods. Um, aged cheeses, sausage, fermented foods, and what they are telling you, as every website on asthma will say, is that these foods have tyrosine, which converts to tyramine, and that tightens up your brain. True. However, we have seen a lot of people have migraines that are triggered by other things, too. And it doesn't necessarily have to be that. And at the Hospital for Sick Children in London, back in 1983, they started exploring this. They brought in a group of kids, 88 kids, and they put them on an elimination diet, not just eliminating dairy, but other common allergens. And 78 of the kids were completely headache-free. And four had a partial improvement, so this is good. Now, in adults, I don't see quite that degree of success, but we do see it uh, up to about 50%. And there are a number of triggers other than dairy that, that sometimes can be implicated. But I think dairy seems to be the most commonly reported one. And if you're dealing with migraines and can't function and are stuck on medications day after day, it's really, really, really worth it to get the dairy out of your diet and see how you do. So, Lauren's got no, migra no, no migraines anymore. All right, let's talk about rheumatoid arthritis. If you look into your joints, if you've got arthritis, the joints are inflamed. The, 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 the synovial lining is looking ugly. It's inflamed. It's inflamed because it's being attacked by the immune system, which has been alerted by some protein that got into your body. That's how the immune system works. A virus comes in, you, 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 the, the proteins on the virus trigger an immune response. This may not be a virus. It's some other kind of protein that got into you. 
And what proteins do people get? Well, dairy proteins are one of the ones that people are sensitive to. So researchers have looked into this and starting with an individual case report back in 1985, it was one girl. She had terrible juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and a doctor said, a, a thoughtful doctor said, get away from dairy, this could be it. Symptoms completely remitted. And then she went and visited grandma who would give her milk chocolate candy. And her symptoms came back. And she got off it and the symptoms went away. And then uh, a pediatrician said, this can't be true. You should have milk for calcium. Her symptoms came back. And they went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And the pattern became inescapable. So they published the uh, findings in the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine saying, here's one case. Maybe other people have diet-induced uh, arthritis. And so triggers have been identified, not in everybody, but somewhere between 20 and 60% of people in research studies. And in Oslo, Norway, researchers brought in a group of people and started them on a juice fast, and then a vegan diet, and then a lacto-vegetarian diet. But within the very first month, they found clear-cut symptomatic improvement and reduction in, in biomarkers as well. Uh, less pain, less tenderness, less swelling. And then John McDougall in Santa Rosa used a vegan, just a vegan low-fat diet and found that within a four-week time frame, you saw uh, improvements, particularly in people who are relatively new to having rheumatoid arthritis. Prostate cancer is one of the most common forms of cancer that we have, obviously. And for many, many years, researchers have said, this is something, that it goes with milk. That the countries that have the highest milk consumption, that's on the, on the right-hand side, they've got the most prostate cancer. Well, at Harvard, the Physician's Health Study said, in our group of 21,000 physicians, it's true. Two and a half servings of dairy products a day, every day, increases your risk of prostate cancer, about 34%. They did another study called the Health Professionals Follow-Up Study. Same thing. The more milk, the more prostate cancer. In this case, 60%. So what we believe is happening is that the hormonal effects from the milk trigger either the initiation of cancer or more likely the aggressive growth of cancers that happen to form. So rather than having those cancer cells die, they grow and they promote their, their spread is promoted. Now this is Chicago, in the Chicago Health and Aging Project, researchers looked at what might be the scariest disease of all. They brought in hundreds of men and women and asked them what they ate, and then as the years went by, they looked to see who developed Alzheimer's disease. And the very first foods that they keyed in on were things I knew all about as a kid growing up in North Dakota. Uh, my mom had five kids and we would come down to the kitchen my mother took a fork and she put the bacon on, out of the pan into these paper towels to cool down. And then when, the, when there was no more bacon in the pan, she would carefully lift, lift that hot pan and pour the grease into a jar. Did your mom do that? She, she was going to save it. And she didn't put the jar in the refrigerator. She just put it on the shelf because when bacon grease cools down, what happens to it? It hardens, it solidifies, and that's a sign that it's loaded with saturated fat, bad fat, the fat that raises your cholesterol. And then, of course, the next day she would spoon it back into the frying pan to fry eggs in it. Uh, it's amazing any of her children lived to adulthood, but that's what we did. So, but, but the number one source is not bacon, the number one source is dairy products, and meat is number two. And some people in Chicago eat relatively little saturated fat, around 13 grams a day. Some people eat a lot, 25 grams a day. And the researchers then said, okay, are these groups the same with regard to whether they get Alzheimer's disease? And here's the numbers. There's the people eating relatively little saturated fat, their Alzheimer's risk. There's the people eating a lot. They did it again using now looking at trans fats, the fats that are in snack foods. And what they showed is it's almost identical to heart disease. If you are eating the bad fat, you're at high risk. If you avoid it, you're at low risk. It's amazing. And what this shows us is those of us who have thought up until now that Alzheimer's is entirely genetic. Genes are in two categories. There are the dictator genes that give orders. You will have blue eyes. But the genes for Alzheimer's disease are more like committees. They make suggestions. You, you might get Alzheimer's disease, but it depends on your lifestyle. You might get diabetes. 
A lot of the disease genes are not dictators. It's not all or nothing. It depends in part on, on, on what you do, whether they express themselves. So cheese and other dairy products are by far the biggest source of saturated fat in the American diet. So even though people say get away from it, they don't go the next step and say don't eat the dairy products, which is giving it to you. Thank you.